So, good morning. Linear algebra continues onward. We're in a new section. Uh, section 1.5, and this is homogeneous systems. And we'll use homogeneous, I mean, we'll discuss them and then we'll use them as a jumping off point to talk about systems of equations with infinitely many solutions. So, homo meaning same. A system is homogeneous if all of the numbers on the right of the equal signs are all zero. So, for example, 2x plus y minus z equals 0, x plus 2z equals 0, x minus y minus z equals 0. Just uh, coming up with something kind of at random here. This is homogeneous because of all of the zeros on the right. And homogeneous systems are special in a few ways. We've said that a system of linear equations doesn't have to have solutions. Um, but every homogeneous linear system does have at least one solution. They're always consistent, if we remember that piece of terminology. Um, in particular, looking at this system, if x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, then all of these equations are satisfied. If all of the variables are zero, then these equations just become zero equals zero, zero equals zero, zero equals zero. So all homogeneous systems are consistent. The solution where all of the variables are zero is always a solution and it's called the trivial solution. So if you have a homogeneous system, the question isn't, is there a solution? Um, the question isn't even exactly what is a solution, because we know that all of them have this as a solution. But the question is, you know, Maybe it has infinitely many solutions, and if so, what are they? So, all homogeneous systems have at least one solution. If we remember our options, a system can have zero or one or infinitely many solutions. 
So since we can't have zero solutions, our options are one or infinitely many. And if we're interested in how many solutions a homogeneous system has, we can state it as a theorem theorem a homogeneous system has infinitely many solutions if and only if it has at least one free variable. And the homogeneous is important here. I mean, you hopefully remember from last Thursday, we had a theorem that was something similar to this. Um, free variables sort of gave you infinitely many solutions. But you ordinarily can't just, I mean, if I just scribbled this out, it would be a false statement. And the reason it would be a false statement is maybe we have an augmented matrix. And when we put it into reduced row echelon form, we get something like this. And here our variables are x, y, and z, and y is a free variable. There is no pivot position in the y column, but there are no solutions because that last row is saying that zero equals three. Um, well, this can't happen if you have a homogeneous system. In particular, if you have a homogeneous system, then the last column is all zeros and the last column stays is all zeros when you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. If you started with a homogeneous system, we'd have ended up with that. So we do need that word in the statement of this theorem. In practice, I mean, a lot of this is sort of, a lot of linear algebra is like this. In practice, we're not going to use this theorem, really, to decide if there are infinitely many solutions, because um, to use this theorem, you have to put the matrix into reduced row echelon form. That's the only way that you can figure out what the free variables are. And if you've put the matrix in reduced row echelon form, you've done all of the work of solving it. And this theorem is kind of going to be a non-entity. Let me get my calculator up. We'll want it in a moment. So let's look at an example. And when I have three variables, um, three variables, 
I normally just use x, y, and z for ease of writing. This is a homogeneous system. Like all homogeneous systems, it has the trivial solution x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. But does it have any other solutions? Now, per the theorem, we need to know if there are free variables. Was, but what that's going to mean in practice is that we're going to solve this system and see what happens. We'll go to Our calculator, go to matrix, then I normally just keep overriding A. It's three rows, four columns, two, five, negative four, zero. Negative three, negative two, four, zero, six, one, negative eight, zero. Is so everybody, I mean, I'm just, I know I'm doing this fast, but you know, you've done the homework. Are people comfortable going from this system to this matrix to doing what we're doing in the calculator? Okay, then we'll quit out and we'll go reduce row echelon form on A, and okay, well, there aren't any free variables. Um, this X column has a leading entry one in it. This Y column has a leading entry one in it. This Z column has a leading entry one in it. So all of the variables are basic. But also, you know, sort of going back to what I said earlier, this first row is telling you x equals 0. The second row tells you y equals 0. This third row tells you z equals 0. So, so this is also the only solution. I mean, it's not really a matter of using the theorem. We solved the system of linear equations, and that's the solution that we got. Let's look at an example where there are infinitely many solutions, and then let's use that to see again to the question of how do we write those solutions down. I mean, if there are infinitely many, we can't just list them all. plus y plus z equals 0, y minus z equals 0, x plus 2y equals 
Let's look at this system. And again, just like we did in this frame, we'll solve it. We know, once again, just like we did in the last frame, we know that there's this trivial solution of all zeros. Um, we want to know if there are other solutions. So we set up this augmented matrix. One, 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 zero. We don't have it written in, but you know, these blank spaces give our zeros. There's a zero X and a zero Z. And we'll go to our calculator and we'll enter in one, 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 zero, zero, one. Negative one, zero, one, two, zero, zero. The most monotonous part of this class comes when we have to bring out the calculator. And we'll do RREF, Gauss Jordan elimination, is what the algorithm is called, but RREF is short for reduced row echelon form. And okay, this time we have a free variable. Um, our leading entries, I don't know if you can really see this white mouse on the cursor on the white background. But this one in the upper left, and then this one down here, those are our two leading entries. So this third column doesn't have a leading entry in it. The columns correspond to X, Y, Z. So Z is a free variable, and there are infinitely many solutions. But let's now look at this further. Let's see, where is it? Where is it? One, zero, two, zero. Zero, one, negative one, zero. And then zero, 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 zero. And let's remember that our columns correspond to variables, except for that last column, which corresponds to equality. And let's remember that these rows correspond to equations. And in this example, well, I apparently didn't write the conclusion down. But in this example, the equations were so simple that you don't really need to think of them as equations. X equals zero, Y equals zero, Z equals zero. Here we have some genuine equations. X plus two Z equals 
is zero. Y minus Z equals zero. And then this last equation is what I call a dummy equation. That's not really technical terminology, but I mean it's kind of fake. It's just telling you that zero equals zero. You're not getting any real info from this. This isn't an equation, but we know it, and I'll write it down, that z is a free variable. So any combination of x and y that satisfies those equations is a solution. Like, if, um, I don't know, if x equals 1, then is, and z equals negative 1 half. That makes the first equation true. And then if y is also negative 1 half, that makes the second equation true. So we can get solutions from this but it's a little awkward. And what we're going to do is write this in what we call a parametric form. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we're going to bring in the vectors. Every statement about a system of equations is basically a statement about vectors and vice versa. And we'll copy this over so we have space to work with. Here and that's we would normally align our variables. So let's give space for me to write my y. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get any free variables on the right. So when we have systems of linear equations, you know, we have our variables all together on the left. But we're done with that. We're going to get our free variables on the right. And in this case, we only have one free variable, and it's a z. So we'll subtract that 2z over. Let's write that one in, y equals z is the same as y equals one z. And now, this equation is useless, zero equals zero, great. We knew that long before we started this problem. So, we're going to replace that with a more useful equation. We have an equation for x, we have an equation for y. What we don't have is an equation for z. And the issue here is that z is a free variable. Z can be anything. So what sort of equation could we write 
for a free variable. Well, there's one thing we can write that's definitely true, and we'll maintain this pattern of having the free variable on the right. And that is that z certainly equals itself. z equals z. Again, this isn't standard terminology, but I always use the word buffer. We buffer in the free variables. And now we have, I mean, now we have an equation that's basically a vector equation and can be written as a vector equation. This equals this is the same as saying that the vector x, y, z equals the vector negative 2z, 1z, 1z. And now we're going to change this a little further. Um, if every entry of a vector is being multiplied by the same number, in this case by z, that is the same as scalar multiplication. So this is how we would write our solutions. And every value of z gives us a solution. Like z equals zero gives us the trivial solution. When I was just looking at this and I said, well, if x were 1 and z were negative 1 half, and then y were also negative 1 half, and that would be a solution. Um, that solution comes from letting z equal negative 1 half. So every solution, every value of z gives you a solution, and every solution comes from a value of z. And I mean, the, the reason that this is called parametric, I mean, just connecting this to maybe sort of half-remembered concepts from calculus, I mean, if instead of a z, you wanted to put a parameter t here, you could do that. And then you'd have a parametric equation. An equation is parametric if your variables, in this case x, y, and z, are controlled by some other parameter t. I don't, I don't bother to do that. I, I normally just, I mean, it can maybe be a little confusing, like you've got x, y, and z equal something. So your z is showing up here, and then your z is showing up there. But I don't in practice find that students struggle with that. So this method works if you have multiple independent, uh, that is, I should say, free variables. Like that's just that's create uh, Uh, 
w minus x plus y plus z equals zero, w plus two x plus y minus z equals zero. Uh, we'll talk about this at some point later. In general, if you have more variables, then you have equations. That often means we're going to get infinitely many solutions. So let's, um, let's write down the matrix. 1, negative 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, matrix edit, this is now I had four variables, so five rows, and now one, negative one, 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 negative one, 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 zero, One, two, one, and negative one. I have to go do this quickly or I'll just forget again. But okay, here's our matrix. We quit out, we perform the Gauss Jordan elimination. We get something a little ugly, but it's only really a little ugly if you're using decimals for with fractions. This is fine. to our first row, 0, 1, 0, negative 2 thirds, okay, so um, our variables are w, x, y, z, our pivot positions are, we can only have two because they're the first non-zero entries of every row. And this leaves us, now oh, I know the yellow is ill-advised, I'll change to a darker color in a moment, but this leaves us with two free variables, x and y, are free. So the same basic process we used when we had one free variable is going to stand us in good stead when we have two. Let me start by just writing down. So x plus y plus one third z equals zero, y minus two thirds z equals zero, no, x minus two thirds z equals zero. Uh, 
and I screwed up the first one too. I'm so unused to having W's. That first equation was W plus Y. plus one-third z equals zero. So let me just, because I did make that mistake, let me just quickly verify. One w, one y, one-third z, one x, zero y, negative two-thirds z. All right, so this time for real, we have uh, written down the equations and we don't have we don't even have the zero equals zero equations we don't have anything at all for y and z but the process we identified was to get the free variables over on the right and the process then was to add equations for the free variables and we put the equations in the natural place like if w and can this even happen? Well, never mind. I mean, like if, if there were a free variable between W and X, we'd we'd write the equation in here. What's normally going to happen and what happens here is that our free variables are at the end. So they go at the bottom. And now you decide how much writing you want to do based on how clear you find this and based on what is helpful to you. Like, maybe you'll find it helpful to fill in these zeros is probably the big thing. Maybe, but maybe not. This is something we're really used to, probably, but maybe you'll find it helpful to explicitly put in all of your coefficients. At any rate, W, X, Y, Z equals our first free variable times this vector plus our second free variable times this vector. This process works with modifications when you have non-homogeneous systems that have infinitely many solutions. Let's make that our next port of call. But does anybody have any questions about what we've already done? Then this is probably 
best done via example. Let's look at a non-homogeneous case. So not being homogeneous means there are numbers over on the right other than zero. So, if we're, so going into this example, I mean, I suppose we can use sort of student's intuition if your professor starts talking about infinitely many solutions and then puts an example on the board. But just looking at this, there is no way to know if this has zero solutions or one solution or infinitely many. The answer will emerge when we perform the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So we've got, what, three rows and four, what am I doing? Nothing I want to do. There we are. Edit. I think there would be a quick way in the matrix menu to just clear out matrices when you're done with them, but that is not the case as far as I know. Okay, so now that we've performed this Gauss-Jordan elimination, we can see there are going to be infinitely many solutions. Um, we start by observing that there's at least one solution. There's no row that's all zeros except for the last entry. There's a row that's just all zeros, but the last entry is also zero, so that's okay. So this is consistent. There's at least one solution. And now we can say Z is a free variable. There are infinitely many solutions. Zero, zero, zero. And I never, I mean, because they're all like math majors or science majors and they're not freshmen, I am just kind of assuming that someone will tell, or biz, maybe business majors, I don't know, but I mean, I'm assuming that someone will tell me if, if they're not clear on anything I'm saying, but you know, just the uh, x has a pivot position, so it's basic. Y has a pivot position, so it's basic. Z doesn't have a pivot position because it's free. It can be easy to make little mistakes here. You can look at the Z and you can say, oh, but there's, there's that one there too. 
but that one is in a pivot position. It's not the first non-zero entry of its row. So Z is free. I hope it didn't sound, by the way, like it was casting aspersions on other majors. I just meant, like, you know, college algebra, you have very inexperienced students, you can't rely on them to throw their hand up if they're confused by something. So x plus z equals negative 7. y equals 6. Let me and this last entry, this last row, 0 equals 0. I might not even bother to write that in. But we'll now um, proceed as we did in the homogeneous case. And what we did in the homogeneous case was get, an, um, get the free variables over to the right. And the free variable here is Z. And then we get an equation for the free variable by saying that the free variable is equal to itself. And at least for now, it might be helpful, since we're still inexperienced, to fill in the missing stuff. We've got a zero z in that second equation. We've got a zero in the first equation. Now the only difference between this and the examples we were just doing is that those numbers don't have a variable attached to them. So when we go and turn this into a statement about a vector, we're just going to have a vector by itself, no free variable attached to it. And then we'll get a second vector from there. This does have a free variable attached to it. And there's our solution. And again, every value of z is going to give you a solution. And that is that. As far as section 1.5, it's not a long section, but there's always, I mean, I present it and it seems like everyone's doing it and then the homework seems to be fine. And then I give the first test and there's always trouble with this section. I don't know quite what it is about this material as opposed to other material. I mean, it's not like class-wide trouble. It's just like a few students a semester. But, um, but do work really hard to get this down because, I mean, we're going to keep working with, you know, 
with these linear equations and matrix and vector equations throughout the semester, we, we need to be able to write the answers down. That, that's a pretty fundamental skill for us to have. We have a little time and we're trying to cover three sections this week. So let me, my notes don't extend far into section 1.7, but let me at least present the idea, the main definition.